Hello, and welcome to Piano Tech Radio Hour, the weekly bridge to the future of the Piano Tech community. I'm David Anderson. And I'm Ethan Janney. And we're here to ask great questions, and then we'll shut up and listen to some of the authorities, experts, and most outstanding personalities in our little world of pianos. So, put on your best set of headphones, and let's get started. Hi, everyone from all over. I would imagine all the continents except Antarctica, probably. Welcome to something that I'm deeply excited about. Two human beings that are colleagues and respected, admired colleagues of mine. Dale Irwin, Arlen Harris, opposite ends of the country, different lives completely. They won't say it, I'll say it, they're masters of the piano in their domains. And uh, Dale is like a Renaissance man. He makes, in my opinion, the best soundboards in the world. And he's an awesome concert technician because I've played many, many pianos that he's worked on and prepped and taken that final 5%. And Mr. Harris has done more pianos than I can literally count for incredible world-class globe trotting artists and he's been all over and he's an amazing human being with a wealth of both intuitive and technical expertise so welcome gentlemen thank you thank you very much so we kind of decided that what we were going to talk about was what it takes to consistently do world class piano prep. And that means the piano is a good piano. It's in good shape. All the basics have been done. And you're in that final 5% of precise action regulation, like customized, sweet spot, intuitive action regulation, and then voicing, or then tuning, actually. These are the three crown jewels in my opinion, of piano preparation. Precise, feel-based action regulation, soaring, singing, musical, rock-solid tuning, and voicing to have the maximum sustain, all of this, to promote the maximum sustain, the maximum sing. So let's just start out. Mr. Irwin, give us three minutes on not only that, what it takes externally in terms of expertise and practice, and but what it takes internally, and just some opening statement from you, brother. Internally, I've always been a tone-driven animal, even from my rock and roll days. You know, just grew up in a family, and then uh, over the course of 46 years, I graduated from working in the field to the shop because I didn't like the way piano sounded in the field. And I was limited by what I could do with them. So into the shop, floored hammers for 35 years, playing tone, having others me about tone. But basically the driving force was within me already. I just wanted to create something visual, push the envelope. And so that is my propelling force. Tales of that have evolved over time to only installing soundboards and all of the things that go into building a piano, but selecting the materials to drive the quality of the instrument much higher than could come out of a, a factory. The real teamwork that happens in our shop between Dennis Irwin, Jacob Irwin, Trix Irwin, and myself, as well as Christina Scroggins, who works here occasionally. And we all have thing, the advantage, the opportunity, not to do just one thing, but to actually bring the whole project together cohesively and hear the final outcome and determine if what we're doing is pushing that envelope to the place where David Anderson seems to like it. <laughs> <laughs> and others. Thank you so much. <laughs> Harris, my esteemed, lovely colleague. Give me an overview on what it is to make a piano sing. Well, first of all, I just want to start out by saying thank you to all for the invitation today. It's very kind. 
And thank you, David, for your kind words. I do want to point out to anybody who has not gone on to David Anderson's website, he has samples of pianos that Dale has rebuilt and that he has done all this special work on. I really encourage you to listen to them with good headphones or good speakers. You will hear sonorities and resonances and sounds that you may not hear very often at all in most fine pianos. You'll hear depth. We try to increase the range of tone. We work with depth. We work with colors. We work with textures. You will hear things, if you pay attention, that you usually don't hear. So this is a great training. And to answer the question that David presented, I think the starting point is we are trying to make an instrument to the highest possible level for recording, which is a permanent documentation of a work of art from the composer and the performer or on the stage for the audience to get their ultimate enjoyment and to move them and to have a special situation and for the artist to feel free to perform at their maximum. We have a lot of leeway there and responsibility, but it creates great satisfaction. I prepared just a few things that I was thinking about about this and I'll go through a very brief list because we have very short time today. First, improving the piano performance level opens up possibilities previously unattainable for pianists. We want them to do things and perform things on the piano that maybe they couldn't do on the other pianos. That's with regulation techniques, high sophisticated regulation techniques, and that's with voicing techniques. And then, the pianist will have an opportunity to become a better pianist and the audience or listener experience extreme and profound spiritual effects through the sound, tone, and musical experience in general. And number two is satisfaction of experiencing improvements in the performance of the instrument. It will give us as technicians in charge of the piano or the rebuilder in the case of Dale also, he's not only a technician but a rebuilder, the satisfaction that he craves and, and needs. Three, experiencing the feeling of pushing oneself and the piano to the limit oh. to see if you can bring it closer than it has ever been before, closer to the sublime. To answer David's question, we're going from a really wonderful sounding piano to a sublime piano. Mm. That is exactly what we're talking about today. What's involved with doing this? Yeah. Experiencing the art and craft of piano technology requires going deep into these areas if you're willing to jump into the pool. It's not for everybody to jump in the pool because it requires amounts of time, energy, and effort. If you enjoy doing this, you should do it. If you don't enjoy doing that, you should stay where it's comfortable. It's your comfort level. And that's the beauty of our piano profession. We can stay in home pianos and make them nice and pleasant, and you can choose any path you want. But going this path, it's a little bit like working in an emergency room for a medic. You're under the pressure a lot of times, and I like the adrenaline rush myself. It takes a certain personality, but uh, I find that it can be invigorating if you're able to be successful, solve a problem, and save a concert or a recording. Another part is being a part of the show and a critical part of the musical experience. There's great satisfaction sitting back and listening to your work and knowing that, you know, you were some way responsible for that. And another is being approached and respected as an authority on the sound, tone, and performance of the piano. Many times great pianists will come and recommend you for other things, and it gives you great satisfaction when they come looking for you. Getting back to the sublime... There's a special feeling, and Dale and I and David were talking about this earlier, that a piano, when you get to a certain point in this type of work, high-end work, getting that 5% to the sublime, that it almost it works on intuition at this point. You can intuitively feel and know what might be required of when you listen to a piano. I want to also point out that you'll get very quick at listening to a piano and analyzing a piano so you can figure out what the heck you're going to do, what approach you have within a certain amount of time. If you have the luxury of having a piano in your salon or in your workshop, 
there's not so much pressure. You could really spend days and hours and months working on getting that. But a lot of times you're under a high pressure situation with limited amount of time. You have to pull out all the extensive bag of tricks you have and different products and tools you have available. And intuitively, you will know which tool or which product will work for that particular case. This is my realm and this is what I've worked for. I was thrown into it by accident, working for Steinway at Steinway Hall. And after my many years at Steinway, I was also thrown into it by working for Faust Harrison Pianos, which is a large rebuilding firm in New York. But their retail store was a block from Steinway. So after people would go try out the pianos at Steinway, we had to make sure that they had that 5% difference if they were going to consider buying a Faust Harrison piano. Oh. So it was a difficult situation, but it put me to the test and I had a big laboratory there. That's kind of what I think about getting into this. Wow. 5%. Wow. So for me, I'll just take a little bit of time. I didn't realize how developed my own talents were simply because I had self-doubts, I had insecurities. Mm -hmm. Going on the internet and meeting people like Dale Irwin, who I consider to be a master, and Rick Baldison, and all these amazing men and women that I've learned so much from, allowed me to realize, you know what? My stuff is good. My piano sound good. I actually know what I'm doing. And from that point on, about the last 20 odd years, I've just been at a higher level because it didn't have anything to do with a huge, you know, exponential gain within six months. It wasn't like a Robert Johnson getting some from the devil and learning how to play the blues overnight. It was... I just, my attitude, my state of being about my own value changed. Hmm. And that's what I want to talk about. Wow. How did I get there? I felt it. I hmm. heard it. I had nothing else. I didn't have schooling. I came from the street. I talk about rock and roll. I was a rock and roll musician full time, basically, for 15 years before I got into piano work. Everything was feel and sound and touch and vibration for me. Everything. I learned from that side back, right? Mm -hmm. So it turns out, huge gift, that the very pinnacle of the work as I see it, for me anyway, which is working for demanding yet wonderful players who I can really communicate with, or owners, and making those pianos, maximizing their efficiency to do what Arlen talked about. And I know that that's where Dale lives. And that's been an inspiration to me for two decades. So, back up from there? Sure. I totally relate to what you're saying, because especially starting with the self-doubt, because I think piano technicians are in a world where and artisans is a rarefied commodity. Yeah. And all artists suffer from self-doubt. And for all of you who are listening, everybody starts at the beginning and nobody has all the answers. And we were talking about this just a few minutes before we came on, and that is, if I could express to you how much I've learned just in the last two weeks, it would, you'd probably be kind of dumbfounded. But it has to start at the beginning. And along that way, successful at something, is give yourself the freedom to say, wow, that turned out better than I thought. Maybe I know what I'm doing. I can buy this too. It starts out with Bill Spurlock said, just do basic good solid work. That's the foundation. Good solid regulation. Learn how to do voicing. Learn how to listen. Let your own ears start to guide you in, yeah. into that intuitive path. Slowly, I mean, after 46 years, I mean, just the encourage me and say, man, your pianos are as good as any of us. And I would just go, I don't know. And then time as I'm out really in the real world, I'm at conventions, I'm listening to pianos, I'm, I'm not hearing stuff that I like as much as I'm hearing in my own shop. Or when I go to David's and he's voiced this 
engraver to perfection. And I'm just like staggered in awe of this thing. Or, you know, when we, when David and I put pianos in front of first call artists in Hollywood, they say, we've never played on pianos like this. I think that's wrong. I think these guys deserve that best. And I'm passionate about that because I get to sit back and I get to listen to these guys do things with an instrument that I worked on. Sorry, I got goosebumps right now. To to see them inspired by this, this is really a motivating force and should be a motivating force for all of us, you know, to continue to refine our chops and take it a little bit further. Yeah, those with the best chops wins. You know, that's just the way it is. If you look at it on a practical level, if you can acquire the superpower of, you know, dealers call it check writing, you know, if you can take a, as Arlen said exactly, a really, really good piano and spend four, five, six, eight, ten hours on it and make it sublime, people literally pull out their checkbook and write a check in the commercial realm. That's the difference. It's just, it's amazing. When, a, when an artist you don't know comes up to a piano that they don't know, it's a weird moment, right, Arlen? They don't know. They don't know who you are uh, many times. They don't know. You may have a reputation, but they've seen a lot of, you know, schmooze kings and queens that didn't really know what they, <sighs> the heck they were doing. And they sit down at the piano, and I'm standing on the rim, <laughs> you know, <laughs> at the back of the piano. I'm leaning on the rim. And this <laughs> artist is, you know, they usually play little clusters of notes, right? Up and down the keyboard or soft little stuff. Because anybody can bang the crap out of a piano. But virtually every good player that's ever rolled up to a piano for the first time online has done soft stuff first, right? And then after a minute, they get more confident and they play and they look up and they just, you know, they're happy. Ah, yeah, they're happy. And uh, you can't, that's kinesthetic satisfaction. That's not conscious. That's whole body satisfaction. And man, talk about a payoff. There's no money that can buy that. That, wow. And, you know, I had a hand in that. So I just want to circle back to one thing. I think this whole hour or whatever it's going to be is about, Arlen said it so beautifully earlier. He said, there's a difference between concentrating and paying attention. And concentrating almost like puts a fence around your perception. It's like, uh, it's a work. It's, it, it feels like work. Paying attention is just putting your attention on the work that you know how to do mm -hmm. and watching this beautiful body do this work that you've done thousands of times. It knows what to do. And paying attention is like what we're talking about. Wouldn't you say, Dale and Arlen? Isn't that really what we're talking about, focus? I think it's one aspect of what we're talking about. I think uh, paying attention really brings in the aspect of passive observance. When you can passively observe what you're doing, and I got this from a music teacher that I was fortunate enough to uh, learn it from in New York, Stanley Spector. Oh, famous. Yeah, he was a wonderful man, and he was a mentor of mine. But I apply his theories to piano technology. And when you are passively observing your work, you can easily become one with your work. You stop mm -hmm. to exist, whether you're the guitar player, whether you're the drummer, whether you're the pianist. If you're playing and you're passively observing what you're doing, you can become the piano. You can become the drum. You can become the bass, whatever it is. And I took that into piano technology and not putting effort into what you're doing. The time goes by so quickly and you can and listen so easily to the pianos. And I just want to bring in one quick idea, too, for everybody out there that, you know, wants to bring it to the sublime level. I really recommend you listen to as many piano great recordings as possible and great pianos as possible. So you really get your ear trained for this. This is the first step. 
you have to train your ears. And in the case of the actions, you have to train your hands to feel what a good action is, to hear what a piano should sound like. And then comes just what David was mentioning before, the interaction of the pianist, the artist. When you get an opportunity to get with a really good pianist, ask them what they think about the piano and how it could be improved or what they want. Or sometimes they'll be very vocal and tell you what they want. And sometimes we all hear differently. Maybe they're hearing something you honestly don't hear or you don't prefer the piano sounding that way. That's a judgment call you'll make. But if you listen to what they say, there's been some artists, I've given them a chalk with a chalk holder and I take off the fallboard. I say, look, mark the notes that you hear the way you want it done and I'll take care of it. And they're so thankful when they can participate like that. And they say, oh, really? Well, let me, then some of them say, I don't know. Uh, they back off. Others say, you know, they have a clear idea. They say, well, I think this one's a little too bright or this one's a little too soft and you can work with them. It's very satisfying, like David had mentioned, working with the pianist and you can learn from the pianist as they can learn from us. So keep that in mind to work with the person that's actually going to be performing. Vulnerability is strength. So if you can actually get an artist to, to break it down to a point where they say, you know, it's just, it's not too bright loud. It's just too bright soft. You know, it's too, it's not warm enough when I'm at piano or double, uh, you know, it's just not. Ah, okay. Then you know what to do, right? I'll give you one more quick example with regulation. Yeah. If you find that the artist, and this is your homework, if you find out what they're going to play in advance, you could have an idea of what you need to do with the regulation. But let's say the music demands a lot of pianissimo play. They need a lot of control when they're playing their pianissimo. You want to make sure that let off comes as close to the strings as possible so they yeah. have a great control on oh, that. Yeah. But what happens when you had it set up for powerhouse piano and you want as much power so you have those repetition springs geared up really strong so they have a fast repetition, it will double bounce sometimes. So you have to readjust the repetition yeah. spring to back mm -hmm. it off to get things just set up just right mm -hmm. for that particular night or that particular recording. Right. And that brings up the whole thing of there's a sweet spot. There's a sweet spot for playing Chopin ballads in the action, and there's a sweet spot for playing uh, a concerto, you know? There's a sweet spot, and you have to know, and you have to know the difference, correct? Dale? Well, as a little bit of a redirect, um, we've been focusing on like world-class artists, but a lot of the artists for the people who are watching and for me included are the artists in the home. And so what you're talking about, Arlen and David, we need to also say yeah. this works wherever you are. Oh, absolutely. For example, you know, in the home, I mean, when I send out a restoration, one of my pet peeves is that the piano gets tuned, but in the meantime, the uh, hammer levels dropped and the aftertouch has gone away and then I get a phone call. So please, if you own one of these, uh, <laughs> please take it out and use it. You know, I'm just talking about basics. And this is really not a capstan adjuster. It's an aftertouch adjuster. Oh. Hmm. Okay. Uh, thanks to Chris Robinson for that. And it's true. And so the thing that creates the foundation for what Arlen is talking about is, I mean, you've got to have perfectly level keys. You really do. And at Yamaha, 35 years ago, more, 40, you know, it was like your hammer line has got to be perfectly straight. You've got to have simple tools to determine if your hammer line is where you want it. You've got to have a way to adjust dip in a way that is absolutely spot on. And as Arlen said, that let off has got to be super close. And I got that from Norman Nebla too. This is where the power goes. You're controlling the action right up to the point of kissing the string so you can play soft or you can really dig into it and play loud. But, you know, when you're setting dip, I mean, because you have um, accumulated mistakes in manufacturing, the balance reel pins aren't quite straight or the knuckles positions aren't quite straight. So 
once you get it fairly close, then you can feel this. Ding, 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 whether ding. you need to make slight uh, choices in making the dip according to how it feels. Back checking is a huge thing. I mean, I like close back checking, you know, half inch, if I can get away with it. And it makes a difference in the way the action feels. And a super huge one is there's a, you talk about sweet spots. I can't think of a more important sweet spot as where the back of the key picks up the damper. Oh. You can feel this. And if it's too early, it makes the action feel heavy and clunky. And if it's too late, it's fly away. But when it's in the sweet spot, the whole action has a homogeneous sonority. And then uh, when you throw in a really good voicing on top of that action, as Arlen's been talking about, and everything just seems to come together. And the pianist, the teacher, the artist, they really have trouble. They're, they're suddenly in a space where they're going, oh, I didn't know that was possible. And if you want to be successful in this, be the guy that can fix anything. That's where I started. Yeah. Do you mind if I interject with a question? Sure. You talk a little bit about the damper lift with the key and putting it in a sweet spot. And is it safe to say that that's going to be different on each piano on where that sweet spot's going to be? Or do you find that it's, you know, relatively consistent, a certain... Well, well the answer is it is where it is, but I find it typically... It's about half travel and not before half travel. You can yeah. feel it. I mean, it's the point in the rotational arcs of the key and the hammers and the whip ends where the inertia has been overcome. And when it's at that point, it picks up the damper lever effortlessly. Seemingly effortlessly. Seemingly effortlessly. <laughs> That's right. That's right. And it's a sweet spot, just like... Really, everything is. Every piano is different, you know? There can't not be standardization. The specs are the springboard that you spring off of, you know? I wanted to ask Arlen uh, if he would talk about artists at high levels, their desire for either more or less aftertouch, and how some people, frankly, just they don't want much aftertouch. And that freaks me out because I want, I want it to have aftertouch. But some people, they can just play it. Have you found that, Arlen? Well, so I'll tell you my thoughts. Some people get used to what the manufacturers are putting out with their factory specifications. And there's some manufacturers that have been reducing the aftertouch quite a bit to almost nothing. Mm -hmm. um, that said... I'm telling you, I, uh, for some theaters, there'll be a season where they have seven or eight pianists come from all over the world to perform, and I get seven or eight opinions on the same piano. <laughs> it's either too bright, it's too, it's too yeah. mellow, it's too light, it's too heavy. So I can only tell you, Dale, that it's a personal preference. What's one person's beauty is something horrible Dale, to can another. I, I, can I interject with that We have question? to be flexible with that. But this is where speed comes into play. When you have to develop, and this is challenging but fun, key, techniques um, to work very quickly in situations is it safe like to this. Say that that's they ask for change. Be different on each piano and this happened to me actually be, with Ling Ling in a theater in Kansas City, which uh, we sold a piano there at the theater, and he opened up the series. He wanted the hammer line. He knew what he wanted. He said, I want the hammer line brought up a lot higher. I want to feel more aftertouch. He wanted a lot of aftertouch, but he travel. wanted the hammer line higher. And I said, well, it's going to you know, reduce your, your volume level. He said, I, I don't care. And so immediately I had to do it really quickly. And there's techniques you can use that'll help. You could bring up every third or fourth hammer, fourth or fifth hammer and fill them in in sections and that that gives you a line and i and uh there's other techniques i don't want to use up the time to answer your question it's really an individual thing and some pianists complain to me that they wanted the dampers set up higher where it's about halfway through the travel but you have to be very careful also that that the damper felts really do clear the strings in pedaling because some right. some of them are very careful with their pedaling and they want a little more room coming up, you know, with the, so they have the freedom where the damper felt doesn't interfere with the string. So there's a lot of different factors there. And every pianist has their own way of thinking about things. 
That's right. Listen, there's a couple of fascinating questions that I'd like to get to and have Dale and Arlen and who and Ethan or me address. One interesting comment from Larry Lobel says, but removing the fallboard changes the sound radically. Instead of chalk, I give them some sticky flags to put on the keys, which it's a red flag to me. <laughs> uh, leave the fallboard in place. Uh, incredible. Uh, you know, I'll think about that. Um, and then Brandon Essex says, does anyone have a comment about translating pianists' attempts to talk about their pianos into a plan and scope of work? Well, my immediate response is that's not the pianist's duty. That's your duty. You know, the, the point Arlen was making, the point I and Dale reinforced was that the more communication, real, authentic, vulnerable communication you have with the artist, the more you can get an idea of what the plan and the scope mm -hmm. of work is. They have no idea what the plan and the scope of work is. Sure. Um, I wanted to back up um, with the aftertouch thing because Carl Lieberman asked, do we ever use the bedding screws to slightly adjust aftertouch? And uh, is that acceptable? Well, to me it is. I mean, when I'm setting my level of the keyboard, to start with, I have it really dialed in. So, it, you know, the, the bedding bolts are obviously touching. And if there's a situation where, you know, I'm in a hurry and the aftertouch has kind of diminished and I want to make just enough of a change to give it just a little bit of feel, very carefully, I'll put a mark on the bedding bolts so I know where they were and I'll make a note and I can turn them up just slightly to increase the aftertouch. And then when I'm done, I can put it back where it was and actually do the right thing, which would be to raise the, the hammer level if I don't have time. Oh, very good suggestion. Uh, can awesome. I introduce another, another comment question for you guys? Uh, yeah, I was going to, I was going to actually read one from Bruce Gibson, but absolutely. I'm be just my interested. Guest. I've been do thinking it. about it since we started. Uh, almost. So I don't know if you guys are familiar with this thing called the Dunn and Kruger effect. Is anybody familiar with that? Dunn and Kruger. Dunn, I think it's Dunn and Kruger, but maybe it's really? Dunn and Kruger. Yeah, I so. Isn't that a steakhouse? <laughs> so I'm the way familiar that, with Freddy Kruger. <laughs> so the Dunn and Kruger's effect is this effect um, that they've studied where uh, the easiest way to, to explain it is if you have someone take an exam, right? You have a lot of people take the same exam. The people who did well on the exam will actually not think that they did that well if you ask them. And if you go down to the people who did really terrible on the exam, those people will think they did amazing. And it's a very, <laughs> it's a very um, consistent effect that you can find in all areas. And basically what it reflects is like the better that you get at something, the harder it is for you to imagine that other people don't get it too. You know, mm. you, you kind of like forget that you know it that well. And then at the same time, the less you know about something, the less that you know that you don't know. And so I just wanted to introduce this concept into what you guys have laid out so far, which is kind of this idea of like, sort of just trust yourself, you know, <laughs> figure it out. You know, like that question about, should I use the balance rail to, you know, adjust things or not? One thing that came to me, and then I'd like to put the question to you guys about everybody goes through this process of not knowing what they're doing to know sure. what they're doing. So for example, what I noticed about what you said, Dale is sure you'll do that, but you also mentioned how you're very careful about if it didn't work, you know, that you would have ways of fixing it and things like that. Mm -hmm. That brought to mind that like, how's a way of knowing <laughs> that you know enough to kind of trust yourself. And it's almost like if you think it's easy, if you think it's simple, then you're probably, to you're not well advanced. But if you see that there's a lot of complexity to the situation, there's a lots of different facets to incorporate, then you're probably actually at that level where you can trust yourself and just focus on all those different facets that are coming into you sort of organically. Any thoughts on that, guys? And people telling what part in the path of the Dunn and Kruger effect they're at as well, far as I, trusting themselves? Yeah, I, I call that trial and error. <laughs> <laughs> and you learn from making mistakes. I mean, I've made so many mistakes. You know, I started the Piano Rebuilders Anonymous Club. So <laughs> I think a lot of times we overthink it. We overthink a lot of things where really the solution is quite simple. And, you know, if something doesn't work, you can always say, well, that didn't work as well as I wanted, or 
I wouldn't do that again. I mean, these are all little decisions that over time become intuitive. Wouldn't you agree, Arlen? Yeah, totally, totally. That's what I'm talking about. Your body has done these things. And your body, whether you paid attention or not, it paid attention. And it's burning this stuff in. The more you can just, as it's a perfect phrase, passive observance. Just watch your lovely, insane, trained, thousands of hours done this body will do a brilliant job. It will. You have to have faith in that intuitive capacity you have. And yes, Ethan, see that it's complex, but that your whole being is it's no problem because your whole being is way more sensitive and masterful than your own cerebral, mostly self-critical, you know, yeah, kind yeah. of dialogue to try to fix it, you know? And that's what Dale was saying. I mean, geez, we could go on. We could be here for 10 hours today doing this. <laughs> it's amazing. This is really important, and I didn't want to drop it out. Bruce Gibson says, unfortunately, there's no concert hall or recording studio in my neck of the woods that's going to pay me to set up their piano for each artist and the repertoire they will be performing. No. But no. you can make <laughs> the pianos that you work on sing. And that's going to bring massive, you know, catalyst of joy to you and to all the players around you. That's what I'm saying. I'm not like Arlen or Dale. I'm not in the shop and I'm not tuning on mostly concert stages. A lot of studios, a lot of film composers, a lot of private pro pianists, but it's not the same thing. So I'm making a piano sing no matter whose it is because they deserve it and I deserve it. Can I jump in there for uh, yeah. uh, Bruce? Uh, you know, Bruce brings up a good question and I know Arlen has faced this numerous times. And that is like in our local arts center, we have one Steinway D piano to meet all needs. And it is bogus. You can't do it. And so Bruce and everybody, sometimes you're just going to end up spending a little extra time to educate yourself when you have the opportunity to do extra things just to prove to yourself that you can bring that one piano to a place where the majority of people will find it acceptable and then when somebody comes in who's very demanding, this is where, you know, Arlen said something about uh, humility. You can say, well, let me see what I can do. And you can do a little bit. You can't take the voicing up and down, you know, like a Venetian blind, because the hammers will be gone. So yeah. let them know that you're on their side, that you'll do what you can with the understanding that, look, I have one piano to meet all kinds of artists. And then make the piano, as David said, sing through voicing, through leveling strings, mating hammers, right. getting the let off right up where it should be, doing a really basic fine regulation. And part of the problem is that we're not very good salesmen. In, in the car industry, Jacob, my son, who was a Mercedes mechanic at one time, said, this is the art of upsell. You have to learn how to upsell which means you have to paint a picture for somebody. Is the piano making you happy? No. Well, here's what you can do. Here's what's possible. And here's what's not possible. I can't encourage you any more than that is to be objective, be observant. Don't tell people what they should do. Give them their options about what's possible and what you can be done. But also they're going to say at the end of the day, well, how much is that going to cost? And you need to have an idea. And don't undersell yourself. And I hope that helps. Oh. All right. So let's talk about the power of voicing. And I know you and I, Dale, really come from different places. You like to go up. I like to come down. It's basically as simple as that. We can say, ah, nah, nah. but when we came together, we kept saying, Dude, your 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 voicing sounds like my voicing. Yeah, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and it was like, yeah, how does that work? Because <laughs> you were like an acolyte, and still are to this day, of the Ronson Vikert and various hammers. 
that really you need to work with and like have as many voodoo tricks with with hardeners and papers and sanding and whatever you do, your voodoo thing that I've learned some of, and my voodoo thing with needles, you know? And uh, it comes to that same golden tone that we used to talk about. And, uh, you know, talk about that. I think being a master voicer is, um, I don't think I'm there, but I, what I do have is a very solid fundamental understanding of how hammers work. Yeah. And how the fundamental frequency is created by a softer hammer yeah. or a hammer spring. Yeah. The Irwin Davis flexometer <laughs> has taught me a lot about, I don't know if you can see this, but if you, I drew these lines on it today. Because a hammer is a felt spring. It's not a felt rock. And if you can watch as I squeeze this, Ooh. the top compresses first and it squeezes down towards the molding and then out towards the side. And any hammer that doesn't have this motion, I'm not interested in. Okay? And that's the difference. Whereas most piano hammers are not made this way. This is a Ronson Weikert hammer. And this is the way hammers were made traditionally from 1847 to 1940 and beyond. It doesn't take a lot of genius to work with this hammer and to get it to produce the kind of tonal spectrum that creates this soaring fundamental, the singing part. I describe tone as boom, which is the fundamental, clang, which is in the mid-range, and ping. And everybody wants a balance of that tone. But if you start out with a fundamental, which causes your traveling wave to just go back and forth and really bring the soundboard right. vibrations out, then getting the clang and the ping is easy. But David, with what you're saying is most of the pianos out there today have a hammer that's pressed into too hard of a mass. And so needles is the only, well, it's not the only, but it is a primary uh, way of getting the hammer felt to open up. And yeah. if the felt is good, you can do it. The problem with that is a lot of times it's not that great. It sounds good for a while, and then it reverts to its former recalcitrant state. That's right. And that's why what you just said, your flexometer, and the influence of low heat, low compression hammers has radically changed. The yeah. end product of Renner and Abel. And Yamaha. Stop. And Yamaha. And Shigeru Kawan. Radically changed. You put any kind of Eichertfeld hammer in the flexometer and it's going to flex. Because yeah. they know. And thank God for the inspiration and for the collaboration and communication between people that come from completely different places. Dave, I'm curious. I wanted to hear Arlen speak to this sound because I'm sure yeah. he's worked with both ends of that spectrum. Oh, no question. I think, you know, you're dealing with felt that's organic and you also have the how it's put together with it's cold or hot. To get back to technicians dealing with felt, you've really got to start to get to know the felt of the different uh, brands and different uh, models and, and you have to have a big bag of tricks yeah. There's no way around it other than experimentation. Mm -hmm. You've got to get these manufacturers to get you hammers. You have to have a piano to experiment on. If maybe you work in a school or a church, or maybe there's a piano back there, you'll be creative and find a way. Maybe there's a customer that wants you to do some work on the piano, and you give them a little discount. But you've got to experiment. And as David said, your body will tell you. That flexometer is telling us what's going on with us watching it. Your mm -hmm. body will tell you, don't use your brain so much. Yeah. Explore, have fun, mm -hmm. and test, and have failures, and have successes, and you'll see how the hammers react. Uh, what Dale said is very important about needles, because the felt does tend in a lot of instances to regress so don't expect to get your result achieved in one quick session. Sometimes you have to go back several times. And again, never expect a piano to be the same piano that you left it even a week ago. 
because it's an organic thing and the wood changes and it's affected by humidity changes and the felts and the leathers and everything else. So be aware of that to always check your work and check the piano. Piano's like a weird mashup of a race horse and a race car. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. So that's an interesting uh, thing, Dave, that you were talking about. The pianos in our shop are a bit of a hot rod because, you know, we select our own spruce, we build our own boards, and a lot of times these, uh, like wood, for example, comes from the same tree. And so same with ribstock, comes from the same board. So you're marrying these things together. I don't know if that's important, but <laughs> it seems to be part of the recipe. But all of these things are blended together. I mean, you've got to have a good basic board. That's the soul of your instrument. Oh. But then on top of that, there's so much to learn in the art of setting up an action. There's uh, custom balance protocols by David Stanwood and Nick Ravagna and, and a lot of different people these days. And I would encourage anybody who is not familiar with those to become familiar with them because it will give you control over the outcome of the pianos that you're trying to hit the bullseye with. And when you hit the bullseye a few times, then you're inspired to continue because, and people will refer you because that piano plays like nothing else. Right. Right. That's right. Arlen, can you speak to that for a little bit? Well, there's one thing for all of us to think about. It's a whole big topic on its own. So I'm just going to throw this out and then we'll leave it like that. But consider the difference of taking a small hammer and having the small hammer shooting up, hitting the string, it has more velocity, it's faster, compared to having a thicker, heavier hammer, more mass shooting up and throwing it at the string where you might get a bigger, rounder tone and have that as opposed to something that gets off the string quicker. These are two concepts, and in, in the case of voicing, think of having like a hammer, like a golf ball that's really bright, as opposed to a tennis ball. And you want to have some flex like Dale is talking about with a tennis ball comes and hits the string and it gets off and the sound expands. That's kind of what we're looking for, I think. And as far as golf ball type hammers, you know, a lot of recordings have this. You can hear it. I think hammers as hard as rocks belong only in rock concerts. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> I hope I threw that out because it's a whole topic about the, where we're going with this. And I think there's a, a lot of experimentation and like the Steinway Humberg hammer is a much thicker, heavier hammer. When you're talking about weights and stuff, you have to compensate for that. It does give a different tone uh, when the New York hammer is a lighter hammer. And there's other issues with that too to deal with. And of course, all the different Ronson line of hammers, they all require very different techniques to deal yeah. with. Um, and also the obels as well. You'll be familiar with many different types of hammers and they all have their characteristics. You're like an alchemist. I read the book Perfume, <laughs> where this, this guy got familiar with perfume senses. You And you have to work with this sense of you dealing with these different felts. It's similar to a perfumer that is dealing with scents. Or I even took classes with some uh, wonderful sommeliers because I wanted to expand my knowledge with the realm of sound to taste. And I found that by dealing with these experts, how they taste things, that they're different. And I would be exposed to them. It actually made me a better voicer because I saw that there were subtleties in taste and smell that we can translate also to our sound. You know, I wanted to comment on that, Arlen, because the, the practical thing is that for everybody who's listening is when we walk into somebody's home or the concert stage or a church, we get to work with whatever's there. And what Arlen said was you have to experiment. And so uh, I totally agree with that. And usually my experiments, if I'm, you know, I have to, I'll take a number six needle uh, if it comes to voicing. And I want to find out what it's going to take to make that piano sound the way that I want to. First of all, I have to find out if it's possible. And if I'm using a one number six needle, I'm not going to destroy the hammer. I'm going to be able to test the density of the felt. And I'm going to do it. Uh, and I'm going to pick the worst hammer. Okay. 
or a couple of worst hammers. And I'm going to spend some time just on those two or three hammers, you know, base, yeah. tenor, upper register. And I'm going to find out if uh, needling in the places which, well, anywhere in the hammer, is going to actually render an effect and how soon will the effect be rendered. And I've walked in on jobs where somebody had just put in a new set of hammers and I've done this and they were not voiceable. I ended up stabbing a couple of hammers a hundred times and nothing changed. Yeah. I told them, I said, there's nothing I can do for this. Yeah. So you have to determine, is it possible before you promise your client that you're going to fix something, you know, see if you can. And if you can, to your satisfaction, then have them come in and listen to the change. Give them some time to get accustomed to what you've done. And most of the time they'll go, oh, wow, this is where you get to upsell. You have to learn how to teach them how to listen. You play A, B comparisons. This is the way you can do it either in home. It doesn't matter where. Concert hall. You know, tell me what you want. Is this what you want? This is practical advice. I mean, when I get new hammers in the shop, if I don't know the hammer, I'll take a number six needle and I'm going to probe it. And the, the problem for me is I'm allergic to that ping. If I'm starting out with ping, I lose interest pretty quick. <laughs> it's like a dog whistle. You don't want that. It's nasally. Yes. And it's too sharp. It's too sharp even at low volume. So you have to know how to take care of that. We're getting close to the time where we said we would stop. And we're going to stop. We're going to go over a little bit, but we're going to stop pretty soon. But what I want to bring it back to is that when I first heard men and women that I consider to be masters talking like Dale and Arlen are, and I am, uh, you know, 25 years ago, 30 years ago, I was like, what the hell are they talking about? This woo-woo ethereal shit that, uh, excuse me, stuff that, you know, the piano will talk to you and, you know, you have to be in a certain frame of being. It's like, what? I'm telling you, it's really true. <laughs> it's not just theoretical stuff. It's really true. If you can trust your own ability of your ears, your body to feel and hear, then you can learn how to make a piano sing and massively increase your own self-confidence, your own ability to see yourself as a, as a real artisan. And, you know, you can work for as long as you, as until you, they pry the tool out of your cold, dead hand. <laughs> uh, seriously. And uh, I just want to say that, I've been thinking this whole time, this whole hour of, man, we need to do a series of classes about, you know, both the technical and the internal, uh, you know, steps to get to this place. I mean, between the three of us, we've developed, I'm sure, so many little tips and tricks of regulation, tuning, and voicing to increase the sing, to increase the sustain, you know, to increase the color and the mystery and the timbre of the of the instrument. I'm just, I'm sad that we have to stop. And uh, Mr. Harris, why don't you kind of wrap it up? I just want to thank everybody for tuning in. And I want to thank Ethan, especially for putting this event on. It's a wonderful gesture and more than a gesture, it takes a lot of work to put something like this on. So I hope all of us will support him with his efforts in piano technology education. It's very important because the better we are, the more serious people take us and the better we can get the pianos to sound, the more inviting the pianos are for people to play and it keeps the ball rolling. And also the demands are gonna be higher and higher as we continue. So I think it's very valuable. And Dale, I thank you for your wonderful inspiration with your work. I'm very familiar with your pianos. David, I don't need to tell you, you know what an inspiration you are as well. I encourage you, all of you watching mm -hmm. to go to their sites and check out their work and see what they do. And I encourage everybody to take it one step at a time 
Mm. And if there's any yeah. questions, you know, hopefully we will be able to have an opportunity to show, go into more detail. We can only do so much in one hour. Sure. You know, and I want to just uh, say a couple of things I, I realized quite a while ago that we have a lot of information, but when it's not coupled with inspiration, real learning doesn't happen. So I'm hoping that between David and Arlen and I today have at least inspired you to think outside of your own box. And as Willis Snyder said to me in 1986, aim for the high end, gentlemen. And if you're aiming for the high end, there will be work for you. Yeah, so one of my customers who's a really good musician told me, you know, we were talking about the future of pianos and everything. And he said, look, in any profession you can think of or find, there's always work for the top 10%. Mm. If you can get yourself into the top 10%, no matter what you do, you will work and you will enjoy your work. Dude, right. telepathic, I've been saying that for 20 years. There's a 10% rule on everything in terms of craftspeople. Thank you so much, Ethan. Uh, you are the man for providing this and making this happen. Daniel, Patrick, thank you. Thank you, men, so much. It's really a pleasure to work with you. Thank you. Bye, guys. Bye. Thank you so much for giving us an hour of your time. Remember that you can catch us live online every Saturday at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. That's right. Go to pianotechradio.com to register so you can interact live and ask questions of our guests. See you next week.